the church has not always existed. This may surprise you. Sometimes people imagine that all believers from every age have been part of the church. But this is not the case. The church was not born until after Jesus' life on earth. We see this from the very first mention of the church in the Bible, in Matthew 16, 18, and 19. Just after Peter finally recognizes that Jesus is the promised Messiah, Jesus says to him, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is the first time that the church is mentioned in the Bible. Jesus promised, on this rock I will build my church. From this promise we can gather some important foundational concepts about the nature of the church. First, observe that Jesus uses the future tense, meaning that the church was something still to come. The church did not yet exist during his earthly ministry. Second, we see that the church was going to have an offensive mission. Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Imagine hell as a walled fortress and the church is storming its gates. We are not intended to circle the wagons and simply hold our ground until Jesus comes back. Jesus intended the church to play offense, actively fighting evil and winning back the world in the name of God's kingdom. Indeed, we see that the church has a direct relationship to the kingdom of God, since Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. The church is not the kingdom itself, but it has a role to play in the kingdom. That much is clear. There are, however, two big questions that stand out in this passage. First of all, what is the rock that Jesus intends to build on? And second, what exactly are the keys of the kingdom that are promised to Peter? We'll consider these in detail now. First, what is the rock? The most natural interpretation is that Peter is the rock. The name Peter and the word Petra, meaning rock, are the same thing in Greek. So Jesus is using wordplay here. He says, you are Petros, and on this Petra I will build my church. This makes sense given what we know about Peter and his ministry. He was the leader of the disciples. Sometimes pastors make fun of Peter because he is always the first to speak up. But this is not because he was foolish. It is because the gospel writers characterize him as the leader and the spokesman for the group. Peter voices what everyone else is thinking. Moreover, we see that in the book of Acts, it was primarily Peter's ministry that instigated the church. In Acts 1, it is Peter who takes the lead in finding a replacement for Judas, who had committed suicide. In Acts 2, it is Peter who speaks to the crowd on the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 people are saved on the first day of the church's existence. In Acts 4 and 5, it is Peter who is called before the Jewish leaders to defend the church. Then, in Acts 5, it is Peter who administers church discipline when Ananias and Sapphira attempt to deceive the congregation. So Peter's role is central in getting the church off its feet. According to Roman Catholic tradition, Jesus' words here indicate that Peter was the first pope of the church. We do not have to go that far, however. Because of the Roman Catholic Church's use of this passage to support the idea of a pope, many Protestants have tried to reinterpret the passage to focus on something other than Peter himself. Some have suggested that Jesus is referring to himself as the rock. Peter has just confessed that Jesus is the Messiah, so Jesus' words, on this rock I will build my church, could conceivably apply to himself. This could make sense, since elsewhere Jesus is called the chief cornerstone of the church. Of course, we have to skip over Jesus' own words, I say that you are Peter, if we go this route. Others have suggested that it is Peter's confession that is the rock. In other words, Peter's belief that Jesus is the Messiah is the key doctrine or rock on which the church is built. 
Neither of these interpretations, however, answer the question about the keys of the kingdom. If Jesus himself is the rock, or if belief in Messiah is the rock, then why are the keys given to Peter? To conclude, it's probably best to view Peter himself as the rock here, meaning that Peter's early leadership was foundational to the church's existence. This does not necessarily imply that the church should have a pope. We don't need to completely reinterpret the passage simply in order to distance ourselves from the Roman Catholic teaching. So, if Peter is the rock, then what are the keys of the kingdom that are given to him? Keys are a symbol of authority. I am a professor at Alaska Bible College, so I have a set of keys that get me into the classrooms. My students don't have keys to the classrooms. I hold the keys because I am in a position of authority. So the fact that Jesus gives him these keys symbolizes Peter's authority in the church. Notice how in the book of Acts, each time the gospel spreads to a new group of Peter people, Peter is the one who affirms their faith and allows them to participate in the local church. In Acts 2, when the church is founded, it is Peter who preaches the gospel to 3,000 Jews who join the church on that day. Then again in Acts 8, the gospel spreads to the Samaritans who might be described as half Jewish, half Gentile. The church leaders wondered if these people could genuinely be part of the church, and it is Peter who visits and affirms their faith. Again, in Acts 10, it is Peter who takes the gospel to the Gentiles and argues for their full acceptance into the body of Christ. We should also observe that other believers are granted the same authority in Matthew 18.18. 18. There, speaking to all believers in general, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. In Matthew 18, Jesus is talking specifically about church discipline. He tells believers that if anyone insists on living in sin, they should not be permitted to fellowship in the local church. This confirms the same idea suggested by Peter's role in accepting new groups into the church. The main idea, being the keys, is membership in the local church. All of our talk so far has focused on Jesus' promise to establish the church. But when did this promise actually come true? This happened on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Although the word church does not actually appear in that chapter, it is clear that the church was actually born on the day of Pentecost. How do we know this? Well, as we have already established, the church did not yet exist during Jesus' earthly ministry. It was still a future thing when Jesus promised, I will build my church in Matthew 16, 18. We also know that the church itself is formed through spirit baptism. We discussed this in our unit on pneumatology during the lesson on spirit baptism. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 teaches, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Thus it is spirit baptism that forms the body of Christ or the church. So the question is, when did spirit baptism begin? Jesus promised it right before ascending to heaven in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. This promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2.4 says, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Later on, after the Gentiles come to faith and receive the baptism of the Spirit, Peter looks back at the day of Pentecost and calls it the beginning. He says in Acts 11.15, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. The only time that the beginning could apply to would be the day of Pentecost. So this line of reasoning suggests that it was the day of Pentecost when the church actually began. Believers were first baptized by the Holy Spirit on that day, 
And ever since then, the church, the Spirit has been baptizing more and more into the same body of Christ.